Good morning! Today I'm out here to fire reduced iron paint pottery. If you've been following my channel for a while, then you know that I've struggled for a long time to try to get reduced iron paint right. But today's the day I finally get it. And why do I say that? Because with each of these experiments, I've gotten a little closer. I've learned a little bit more about how to do it correctly. So today I'm going to take all those bits of information that I've learned from past experiments, apply it to today's experiment along with some recent advice, and hopefully I'll get those red paints to turn black in the firing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the technology of reduced iron paint. I'll talk a little more about the history of reduced iron paint later on in this video. I found that I could reduce iron paint with just an ordinary surface fire if it got hot enough. But then as that pottery cooled, those black paints would turn red as that iron reoxidized. I thought that at a higher temperature, that iron became robbed of oxygen, and at a cooler temperature, it grabbed oxygen from the atmosphere and became red. I found that it had not so much to do with the temperature as the atmosphere. Just the act of pulling the pot away from the coals was enough to start it oxidizing. And so the coals were part of it. Even though they had burned down to hot coals and were no longer actively flaming, they were still absorbing oxygen and keeping that pot from oxidizing. Now a lot of people have gotten reduced iron paint in a lot of different ways. There's a million ways to skin that cat. And I'm not looking for just a way to achieve reduced iron paint. I'm looking for a way to achieve reduced iron paint that seems logical to be the way that the ancients did it. That seems plausible to be a way that the ancients did it. So my plan here today is to fire these pots in this shallow hole and then to cover them up when it's done and smother them and allow them to cool under the surface of the ground so that they can't get any oxygen into them. This is a bowl that I made to do reduced iron paint experiments with a couple years ago. So I'll link that video up where I fired this. In fact, I think there's a couple of videos where I fired this because I've refired it a couple of times. I'll link that up down in the doobly-doo in case you want to see that. And so at this point, it is completely reoxidized, and we're going to try to reduce it again. This is a little canteen I made recently. Uh, it's all painted with a combination of red clay and hematite mixed together in about 50-50 proportions. And this is a mug. Uh, if you get a close-up on this, you'll see that the paint is actually kind of a mess. I put it on really thick, and it started peeling the slip up. So I just wanted to let you know that uh, the paint on this is kind of a mess. And I know it, and I'm going to fire it anyway. I obviously don't know everything about firing pottery outdoors. But I do know a lot. I've performed hundreds of outdoor open pottery firing. And I have no problem sharing the information I've learned. That's why I created an online video-based masterclass to teach what I do know about outdoor pottery firing. It's called Outdoor Pottery Firing 101, covers all the bases, and should get you going on outdoor pottery firing if this is something you're hoping to learn. I'll put the link to that down in the doobly-doo in case you're interested in learning more about firing pottery like this. So my problem with reduced iron black on white is almost not so much reducing the black. Here's some examples of some reduced iron paint that I've gotten pretty darn good. Uh, and, and the last one was this sheep. And although it wasn't pure black, there were red spots. Uh, those areas that turned black were pretty black. Uh, I think the biggest problem that I'm having is getting the white truly white. Uh, it's always a little gray. It always absorbs a little carbon out of the atmosphere. So reducing while oxidizing all the carbon out, but keeping the iron reduced. That's really uh, the trick. This fire has to be smothered to keep the oxygen out as it cools. Because as that fire starts to die down and the pottery starts cooling, the oxygen starts coming in and that iron soaks it up and turns red. So this old potter said, if you smother the fire while the flames are still orange, that, that is the flames coming off the coals. So we're not talking big flames, but you know, the little flames that come off of coals. Now when you're firing at night, you can see that better than firing in broad daylight, but they're still there, there's little flames. If you smother while those flames are orange, you're gonna get black on gray, he said. If you wait until those flames are all blue or white, then you get black on white. That's really the key. I'm probably smothering far too early. As the fire dies down, I'm too concerned about that oxygen getting in and ruining my reduction. 
I need to wait until those coals are literally just blue and white flames and then smother. And then I'm not going to have that carbon in my atmosphere. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. It's burning down now. It's getting down there. At this point, it's a waiting game until those coals burn down to blue white flames only, no orange flames. Then I'm going to use my cover shirts and some soil to smother it. And then it's going to be another waiting game, waiting for it to cool off enough that I can pull it out and not worry about those irons oxidizing. Well, I don't know. Maybe I didn't wait long enough again. It's hard. It's hard when that painted area is exposed and there's a breeze on it and I'm looking at it thinking, oh my gosh, it's gonna oxidize. That waiting, eh, man. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I may not have waited long enough again. I'm just worried maybe I didn't, you know, but what I ended up doing was there was a couple of knots, like really hard kind of knot thicker pieces of wood that were still burning orange and I, I just pulled those out. Everything else looked like it was down to just pure coals, no flames. So um, hopefully I got that part right. Now I just have to wait a couple of hours. I got to wait till this cools down to, you know, something reasonable so I can take it out of there and that iron won't oxidize. So I'm out here at my property today, so I'm going to go look at my ruin and explore and do a few other things here before I come back and uncover this. So. Uh, in a couple hours, it's 10 o'clock now, we'll see maybe noonish or so, we will uh, uncover this and see what we got. Just taking a little snack break before I get back to work. It's, uh, it's just about 12 o'clock now, so it's been about two hours since I buried that. So as soon as I'm done eating my Slim Jim, I'm going to go over and I'm going to start carefully kind of uncovering that. And because my infrared thermometer isn't working, I'm going to have to just feel with my hands and try to uh, figure out whether or not I think it's too hot or cooled down enough. And no doubt that's exactly how the ancient potters did it. try to be brief here because the wind in the mic uh, we got we got our white we were looking for um, most of these whites are pretty hot still most of the whites are really good uh, which is what I talked about earlier that's what I was going for unfortunately uh, blacks I didn't get almost any blacks They're a little there's a little black on the mug uh, but for the most part these are all quite red at least uh, you know on the brownish side of red so let me drive home let me think about where I might have made my mistake and, uh, and I'll wrap up when I get back to my studio and maybe have some ideas on them, how I can improve next time. Iron painted black on white pottery was among the earliest decorated pottery made in the American Southwest. So it seems as though it didn't evolve out of some other tradition or some other technology. People started making reduced iron black paint on pottery from the very beginning of decorated pottery and the Cibola region, the specific type of pottery called Cibola black on white that I'm trying to recreate here today in this canteen. That is one of those earliest traditions of iron painted black on white pottery. It started around 550 or 600 AD with just crude designs painted on the outside of gray or white ware pottery. In the following centuries, this type of pottery evolved into the most beautiful and elaborate designs. It's among the most sought after prehistoric pottery type in the American Southwest. In the 1300s, 
black on white pottery went out of style, replaced by more vibrant polychrome potteries. Well, this red iron paint won't make black designs on a polychrome pot. If there's any red painted areas on the pot that you want oxidized, then you need to use a different recipe for your black. Therefore, the technology of using red iron paint to make black designs was lost. Today, the descendants of the Cibola whiteware potters at Zuni Pueblo no longer know how to make reduced iron black paint because this technology stopped being used around 1325. Okay, I'm back for a second day. I'm gonna try to refire that canteen and get it right. I, I don't accept failure very well. So on my way home yesterday, I kept thinking about the different attempts at reduced iron paint that I've done and going through the different scenarios in my mind. And really, the two most successful were that little test pot with the different kinds of paint on it. That all reduced really good. Even though the whites weren't really as white as I'd like, the reduction was good. And that was buried in a pit in the ground. Now the other one that was had some good reduction on it was the sheep. Now the sheep was fired on the surface, but it was covered with that pot instead of dirt. Somehow I think the dirt is either introducing oxygen or it's leaking a little bit. It's allowing a small amount of oxygen to seep through. So I'm gonna try firing that canteen in the ground this time, buried under the ground. Hopefully we'll get less oxygen in this time and I'll still work at trying to get those whiter whites. So my plan is to just keep firing that canteen until I get it right or until it breaks to bits. We'll see what happens. So let's talk a little bit about what I'm trying to do here today. I'm not firing pottery. That is, I'm not turning mud into ceramics because I did that yesterday. It's already ceramic. I'm just trying to get the outcome on the surface that I'm looking for. So I'm hoping to get the temperature up high enough to reduce that iron. That iron was already partially oxidized on that pot from yesterday's firing. I'm hoping to turn that back black, which we should be at now. I'm also hoping to burn all the carbon out. So when you're firing like this in an open wood fire, that clay is surrounded by, it's in contact with a lot of carbon, not just the wood that might be touching it, but in the atmosphere as well. And so the outside of the pot can come out kind of gray and we want it to be white, as white as possible. So that we have a lot of contrast between the black paint and the white body. I'm trying to do two things. I'm trying to reduce the iron. I'm trying to burn all the carbon out. And that involves getting it hot enough to reduce the iron, but also waiting long enough for all that carbon to burn off the surface and then smothering it so that it can cool without any oxygen in the environment so it stays black. So I'm gonna keep this burning for a while till it burns down to cold. Like I said yesterday, uh, we want those blue white flames. We don't want any orange flames. We don't want any potential carbon in the atmosphere for that clay to absorb. And then we'll smother it and we'll let it sit for a while because uh, yesterday, I think part of the problem was I opened it too early. I think some of that oxidation took place as I and right after I opened it. Uh, so opening it too early is part of the problem. I think firing on the surface and the wind were also factors in yesterday's firing. So the air is a lot stiller today. Uh, I have a much deeper hole in the ground. Uh, hopefully we'll have better success on the black and uh, maybe on the white as well. Still can't believe you love me Okay, I've got it fired and buried. I've got a couple of different options. I could sit around here for a couple hours and then open it up. And then if it's oxidized, I can wonder if perhaps I opened it too early. I can sit around here for three or four hours, bored out of my mind and open it up and not get anything done today but this. Or I can go home and leave it. Now, I've always resisted the going home part because um, for one thing, I mean, it's just sitting out here, right? I mean, anybody could come along and take it a cow could step right in the middle of it and break it. Uh, I just hate that option. Besides which, you know, I'll worry about it 
all night long, but I think I think that's the best option right now. So for the first time ever, I'm gonna I'm gonna go home and, and leave the pot buried here because it's an experimental pot, right? I mean, the whole point is to figure this out. Uh, if it gets broken, it gets broken. Uh, that's how I feel about putting it into the fire. I should feel the same about you know leaving it sitting in the fire as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave the pot here overnight and come back in the morning. And that way, I'll be here in the morning. If it's not fired correctly, if I feel there's some mistake I can rectify, I'll refire it in the morning when I'm here. So I think I think that'll work out. All right, third early morning out here. Uh, I'm really hoping the pot came out good and black today because I'm not looking forward to coming out here early and doing this again tomorrow. Good news is uh, no cows seem to have trampled over the area where the pot was buried, which was one of my concerns. Uh, it did rain last night. Uh, I, I don't know how much it rained here, but enough that the ground is damp down a couple inches. I don't think it impacted the pot at all. The rain was quite late, so it would have been quite cool at that point anyway. But uh, that is an interesting thing because it doesn't usually rain here in May. All right, it came out okay. I've got some good blacks on here. I've also got some good whites on here, but it's also kind of a mixed bag. Uh, there's a big red spot on one side. Most of it is black though. And there's places where the black kind of gradiates a little towards the brownish purpley side. Uh, but for the most part, I got good blacks. I've got a really big smudgy spot right here and you can kind of see the smoke from whatever this was kind of drifting up into this area. So I'm almost wondering if when I threw all that dirt on top of it, uh, if a stick or something flammable didn't fall down in there and burn and, and cause this whole problem right here. Uh, so probably clean fill is very important. And the fill here was not clean. I've been firing in this spot for years and it's just a hodgepodge of charcoal and ash and dirt and sticks and things. So um, probably clean fill would be very important. And, and this was a problem here. Uh, overall, I think I learned a lot and, uh, and you know, I'm not completely unhappy with it. I think. Like I said, in places, it looks really good. So um, I'm gonna take this as a learning experience. I'm gonna say success, and I'm gonna move on to the next one. And, and down the road, I will do some more of this reduced iron paint because this is something I'm wanting to get nailed down this year. If you'd like to learn more about firing your pottery in an open outdoor situation, not necessarily reduced iron, but just an open oxidizing fire, then you're going to want to check out this video right over here, which goes into a lot of detail about carrying out a firing like that. I appreciate you coming with me today. I'll catch you next time.